the challenge for us is that there are there are those who see our diversity as a threat to be contained instead of talent to tap into and you know that is the challenge for us when we're talking about representation gender and racial uh, uh parity uh, in government when we're talking about wealth um, the wealth gap and income inequality. When we're talking about um, a city with a history like Boston, you know, I keep saying what we've got to do is ensure that DNI diversity and inclusion is not just some, you know, kumbaya moment of collective song or some, um, you know, fun bumper sticker or hashtag. Diversity and inclusion uh, at every level is ultimately about, are you willing to share power? So, welcome everybody, good evening. Good evening. Um, the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy is very honored to be co-sponsoring this event, especially with my distinguished predecessor at the Center who did so much to make the Center what it is today. Um, I want to thank uh, Dean Cash and Associate Dean Chan for hosting this event, and thanks to all of you for coming. First, I want to just congratulate Carol Hardy Fanta um, and her co-authors <laughs> on the publication of Contested Transformation, Race, Gender, and Political Leadership in the 21st Century, really a monumental accomplishment. As Susan J. Carroll from Rutgers University says, the book is truly, quote, a unique and indispensable resource. The research and writing for this book has been many years in the making, as Carol will attest to. And in a minute, I will tell you a bit about that history. But let me say first that there could not be a more perfect time for this book. We need this book. We need it now. In a period when the first woman, Hillary Clinton, ever to be nominated by a major political party for president, lost the election and won the popular vote, we need now, more than ever, this book to deepen our understanding of how gender and sexism can constrain women's ability to become elected to public office and to advance to the highest levels of leadership. In a period when the first African-American man, Barack Obama, ever to become elected as President of the United States, is seeing his signature legislative accomplishment attacked and repealed, to say nothing of some unbelievable allegations being made against him at the moment around wiretapping of a presidential candidate. We need now more than ever to deepen our understanding of how race and racism can constrain the ability of both men and women of color from becoming elected to office. So let me say a few words about how the Gender and Multicultural Leadership Project, which is behind this book, came into being and why it is so important. It began almost 25 years ago. And if that's not persistence, <laughs> I don't know what is. So in 1993, Carol's first book, Latina Politics, Latino Politics, Gender, Race, and Political Participation was published and Carol established herself as a, the preeminent uh, scholar on Latinos political participation, as Connie mentioned. 1994 was also the start of a series of conferences and meetings around the country that resulted in collaborations among academic researchers that laid the groundwork for funding, data collection, the website, and eventually this book. In 1994, Carol also brought the first external grant funding to the Center for Women in Politics. She published uh, the Latino Electoral Campaigns in Massachusetts and a handbook by and for Latino candidates. In 2003, the Ford Foundation awarded Carol and her colleagues a very prestigious grant that led to the project on gender and multicultural leadership, the future of governance. This is what started papers being presented at academic conferences, all kinds of cross-disciplinary and very rich discussion, and a national website being launched. In 2007, the data gathering was completed. Preliminary findings were presented to multiracial interest groups, including the first one in Washington, DC. And finally, as Connie said, in 2016, Contested Transformation was published. 
This book is the first and the only comprehensive study of black, Latino, Asian, and American Indian elected officials. Let me just repeat that, the first and the only. This is a very, very significant publication. It is a multiracial, multi-office study that is national in scope. It uses a gender lens in analyzing the personal backgrounds, paths to public office, representational roles, and policy stands on key issues of pressing importance to federal, state, and local elected officials. We want to thank Carol and her co-authors for doing the intensive labor involved in making what was previously a huge and perhaps somewhat difficult to nav navigate national database become publicly available and accessible so that findings can be used by researchers, activists, faculty, students, and current and prospective office holders. So she has done us a great service in this. The original goal of the study was to provide a baseline picture of who the elected officials were at the start of the new millennium. It's now 2017, and the book does just that. As you can see, and from the cover with counselors, uh, Council President Wu and Counselor at Large Presley brings us right up to the present. Because of the complexities involved in creating this national database and carrying out a national survey, I believe that this book may well shape much future research on women in politics and the struggle for parity for years to come. In Massachusetts, we are still struggling to reach political parity in our government. You will hear shortly from two prominent Boston leaders who work day in and day out on the front lines of change about progress that is being made in the Boston City Council. On the state level, progress has been, I would say, slow. Perhaps you would say sluggish. Out of 200 legislators in our state legislature, 20 are officials of color. That would be 20, 10% two senators, 18 representatives, and only five out of the 20 are women of color in 2017. Certainly this is something that the book and that all of us, I think, in this room will not accept. This is a status quo we will not accept. Since its founding, the Center for Women in Politics has been committed to advancing the political leadership of women and people of color, and the current political realities have only made our commitment to students, our policy work, and our research even stronger. With Carol's book, we now have the data and the inspiration, really, to move forward. We hope at the center to bring diverse constituents together and move from contested transformation to complete transformation. <clears throat> Tonight, I'm going to talk about the key findings, but first, a bit of a backstory: How did the book come about? It was a team effort with my co PIs and co-authors. I don't know if uh, Van Pinder Hughes is rel relatives in the room, anybody? I think they, somebody, somebody heard about the event tonight, so I thought maybe she'd come now. All right, well, it was a team effort with my, my co-authors and co-PIs on that project. We started meeting a long time ago, as Anne mentioned. But I want to just mention that in 1998, Christine Sierra and I locked ourselves in a tiny room for five days in Wheatley Hall with no windows. It was like a box. And we to write a concept paper for the Ford Foundation. We got the grant from the Ford Foundation in 2003. And so we got started right away with that. I remember driving down the highway with my husband, sort of trying to figure out what we were going to say about the survey. What question, should we put that survey question in or not? So this is a very intense project. And talking on the phone with Christine on the, on the phone. So it's, but I, we start, I started writing the book in 2009. And I retired from the center in 2012 because I knew I wasn't going to finish the book until I got, had time. So I'm very glad to be here because it's done. This says it's done. <laughs> So it's really done, thank you. Um, it's very much a story of perseverance and of taking a very long view, which is a lesson for people in politics. Don't give up. So that's, I think, a very important one. You can sometimes take, things take a long time to come to fruition, and let's not um, think it's over before it's over. So we had to really persevere to get this book done. We'll tell us another story. But uh, first, before we got, could do it, before we go further, I want to tell you a little bit about the data, because somebody mentioned, uh, Anne, I think you mentioned it, the database. We had to create this complicated, database of t over 10,000 elected officials of color, but from the different sources, none, none, none of them came in the same way. You had to like p find ways of melding these three data sources. The Asian group came on paper. We had to actually type in these people's names. And um, 
Others came with different information, different ways. So you couldn't just meld this data set into a group. You had to really, and then you'd go through it line by line. And then what we did, and they, but these 10,000 people were members of Congress, statewide officials like governors, uh, lieutenant governors, secretary of state, et cetera, state legislatures, legislators, and local officials, members of county commissions and boards of supervisors, members of city and town councils, a board of selectmen and boards of uh, aldermen, and then members of local elected school committee boards, which are, nobody does this. Nobody's done this, and it's very hard to do this kind of thing. So um, then we added some features, which was to include eight American Indian state legislators, because we couldn't do all the levels because there were not data sets to find them in. So then we, but the American Indian groups really wanted us to say, don't leave them out, please don't leave them out. So we did what we could there. And then we attached jurisdictional data, how, what the characteristics were of each person's uh, district, or pl like the county, of, a county member would represent, what county did he represent, how many, what, what percentage of racial races were in each group, um, educational attainment of the residents, um, poverty levels, whether Native American, Native born or, Ameri or, or uh, foreign born, et cetera. So that, that allowed us to do a lot of analysis just with the database alone. Then we updated the database for all except local officials in 2012, 2014. That's what Marla was very helpful in doing that. Um, we did, then we did a telephone survey of elected officials from the database. These included state legislators and the local officials we mentioned, county, municipal, and school boards. Now, why we wrote the book, I want to tell you a little story also about that. We wrote the book um, uh, for many reasons. One, we had this data, we'd done this data, like we really had to get it, fin finish it, right? It had to be done, and uh, you can't just let it sit there we're doing nothing. We worked very hard on that, so that was one reason. But the main reason was that, I'll tell you a little story about how in, we used to meet in many places in the, in the country, California, you know, uh, Colorado, uh, Park City once, all, Texas, all over the place, Washington, D.C. several times, Boston several times. But one time we are in Chicago in 2004. We had just gotten the grant, gotten started, we were developing the survey, and we said, okay, we, since we're in Chicago, we're on the south side of Chicago, we wanted to go see if we could see one of Obama's uh, signs. He was just running for state, he, would, he was state legislator, state senator. He was running for the U.S. Senate, right? So he, he was sort of a new person, new face, very exciting. So he said, oh, we go, let's go find one of his signs. We just want a sign. We're driving down the car, all five of us were in the car. All of a sudden, the person driving, Diane, slams on the brakes of the car. There he is! He was spotted. We leap out of the car. We leap out of the car left everything in the car, our laptops, our, our bags, <laughs> in the middle of the street with the doors practically open. That's how excited we were. So we get out and we, um, we run after him into this barbershop. It was a Saturday evening in a bar black barbershop on the south side of Chicago. But we go in anyhow because somebody let, said, oh, that's my cousin's barbershop. Go on in. So we go on in and we start telling him all, just like I do, excited about the pride. Oh, we're a group of women. We do this gender multicultural leadership project. You'll be interested in this. We'd love to shake your hand. So he looks, he all of a sudden, after a little while, he's, he's he looks down, down at us with a, I'm going to read this, a, an air of considerable puzzlement and asking, who are you guys? <laughs> In a sense, the way we wrote this book responds to his question, not about who we were as a multicultural group of women scholars, but rather about who they are, the women and men who make up the nation's multicultural elected leadership and govern this country. What are their personal, family, and political backgrounds, why they first ran for office, and their views on and experiences with political leadership, governance, and representation. So that's why we write, wrote, read the book, wrote the book. And in terms of findings, the title of the book says a lot. It's about a transformation. Yes, there's been a transformation in terms of growth of the numbers of elected officials of color in this country, from Obama all the way down to municipal and school board levels. But it's been contested all the way. Is it, and the questions arise, is it two steps forward and one step back? Or lately, it feels like it's one step forward and two steps back. We have to decide what that is. It's a debate. Um, but let's start with the growth a little bit, because I think not all of you are going to read the book. You might want some information. A combination of the demographic fa changes, and most important, the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Immigration Ra Act in 1965, plus its changes and, and reauthorizations and expansions to language minorities, led to a dramatic increase in the numbers of people of color holding elected office, the positions of political leadership we talk about in the title. Within just five years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, for example, black elected officials increased more, by, by more than 400 percent. They went from a few dozen in 1940 to over 10,500 today. Latino elected officials increased by almost, four, almost 400,000 since 1970 to more than 6,000 today. 
And Asian American elected officials also grew exponentially, although the numbers remain relatively small comparatively. Now, besides the voting rights and the immigration acts, the other factors that contribute to the growth of elected officials is the role of gender. Because what's the takeaway of this book? The takeaway of this book is that women of color have been the force for change in increasing representation of people of color across this country. And they've also been the major contributor of the growth of women's representation in general. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit. For each group, women of color make up a larger share of the respective racial and ethnic groups than white women do of white ones, white elected officials. So in 2012, for example, black women make up 37 percent of black elected officials. All, and all the gains in black elected officials are due to the increasing numbers of black women elected to public office. If it weren't for the black women, there would be flat or, or decreasing, okay? Same pattern for Latinas and Asians. Latinas make up 34 percent of, la of Latino elected officials, and among Asians, women's share increased from 12 percent to 32 percent in 2012. Now, white women, what percentage are they of white elected officials? Like between 17 and 20 percent maximum. So women of color as elected officials are a larger share. That does not mean they're they're, they're proportionate to their population size. Mm -hmm. So it's still uh, it's a serious underrepresentation, except perhaps with black women in Congress. That's the only place where you get black women in Congress sort of have a parity with white women, which is still too low, because white women are not 50 percent. So, but at least in terms of women, they have reached parity, pretty much parity in Congress. But now, in the 2016 election, we were very, we did not talk about the 2016 election in the book, because that was, we wrote it before then. But, um, there was stunning support for the findings of our study because as depressing as it might be for those of us who were eager to see a woman finally become president of this country, there were some bright, bright spots. For example, in the U.S. Senate, if Kamala Harris and Tammy Duckworth, for women of color, had not won their contests and Catherine Cortez Masto had not beat Joe Heck to be in Nevada to become the first Latina in the U.S. Senate, the Senate would have been more Republican, more white, and more male because instead of just one, before the, that election, only one woman of color was in the U.S. Senate, Maisie Hirono, from, Democrat from Hawaii. Women now make up half of all the women of people of color in the Senate in one, one election, just like that. And of course, going from one to four is not so great, but still, it's, it's big. I consider it big. And as Democrats, they also provide a party counterpoint to the Republican men of color contingent. Because what's odd is that even though, as I say throughout this little talk, that the his blacks and Hispanics especially, but uh, Asians increasingly, are heavily Democratic. But Ted Cruz, Tim Scott, and Marco Rubio are all Republicans. Now, why would that be? Why would the people, men of color in the Senate be Republicans? The only, the only Democrat of color in, in the Senate, besides Maisie Hirano, was uh, Cory Booker, right? So that's odd. So they will, g the, as Democrats, they also provide this party counterpart point to, and give voice to justice issues, otherwise it might be ignored. They also may help during the um, um, Supreme Court course justice uh, votes. Second, they take office at a time when white women in general have lost seats or stayed the same. So that of the 14 races in which women ran for the U.S. Senate, two female incumbents won, Patty Murray and, and Lisa Murkowski. But the, in the news media, all they focused on was, was, Mary, was Maggie Hassan and going to beat Kelly Yacht. Oh, is that the big news? Turns out that's not really the big news because, yes, she did, but of all the other 11 white women that ran, they all lost. So the women of color who ran won, women of color, white women lost, other than Maggie Mag Hassan. That's very important because, and the same was for the state legislatures, too. If it had not been for women of color, the numbers of women in general in Congress and state legislatures would have gone down this year. Right now, we're sort of plateaued a little bit. At least it would, would not have gone down. Now, so as Obama asked us, who are these guys and women in office today? Now, we have lots of details of who they are, and if you're interested, look at the take, buy the book, look at the tables, chapter three, there's a lot of great, really great tables. Um, but I kept rewriting this. This is the chapter I started with, kept writing, it should be easy, very boring to write, just read about numbers, so. Um, but there are a couple points I want to make. One is that education is the top occupation for women it, who are elected officials, okay? So that's a, it's a, one of the, quote, feeder occupations. Uh, the others are business, law, and af activism. But that's number one for, for the women of color. And that the vast majority of blacks, Latinos, are Democrats, as well as a smaller majority, but still a majority, of Asian Americans. 
so those are my two takeaways for that chap the demographic part of it. But what's the story? Because the literature always makes it sound like that's the important part. Oh, that's who they are. Oh, the, what do they achieve? What do they? What do they? What do they? What were their choices? What were their achievements? The story is though that people bring personal and family resources to elected office, and rather than see educational attainment, occupational status, and even whether you're married or foreign-born, those are not really individual achievements or choices, especially for people of color. These are contested political dynamics where opportunities accrue to some, and for others, access is restricted. So you don't. Be, choose to be a teacher or in elementary school because, oh, that's a good job for a woman. You, you choose it because you're collectively, you fought for access to get into schools. And now there's fights about bilingual education, other things. But there's fighting about, it's political fights to get these things for people. Your occupation, what kind of occupation are you going to have? It's not something just you're handed, oh, you oh, I think I'll be this. You don't be that. You don't get to be that. You have to fight these, for these things over the history of this country. Um, I also have to fight to get in here sometimes, though, too. So uh, anyhow, now I'm going to change now to another topic that I want to talk a little bit about the decision to run. I'm hoping that Ayana and Michelle, you'll, you'll talk about that when you do your introductory remarks. Why did you run for office? But I want to start with putting to rest the notion that women, women need to be asked. And I was talking to somebody who was speaking with someone who they do research. They, oh, women need to be asked three times before they'll run. Then all of a sudden, women need to be asked six times before they run. Then all of a sudden, it's great inflation. Women need to be asked seven times, nine times. Literally, there's things that goes like that. You can read in the book. How many? I've got quotes. And then they said. So then I said, started thinking. Well, wait a minute. We found very few women said they'd run because they were asked to run. But it's. And then there's a criticism. Well, you weren't asked to run. No, we should ask more women to run, and therefore they'll run more. So women don't run because they're not asked to run. Okay, that's good. But, and I myself, I'm guilty of assuming that was true. In 2003, there was a political summit here, for women, and I stood up at the end of it. And, and said that women need to be asked to run, repeating what I'd been told. Consider yourselves asked, trying to get people to get motivated to run, as if that was going to make a difference, right? People went, left home and said, oh, well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll run now. No. But no matter how many times activists repeat it, it's largely based on anecdotes and studies with limited generalizability. In fact, I would, I'd say I had to go to the original sources. For example, I'd go to, I went to someone who said, oh, we say that. We don't, really, we don't know where we got that from. Well, I got that from so-and-so. Oh, so someone said, well, research shows. I said, what research? Okay, that's the research. So I called researchers and said, oh, no, I never really said that. And, they missed, and every time they say it, I say it's not true because they, what happened was it gets extrapolated. So women report they were not asked to run. When you say, were you asked to run? People say, no. Okay, then they extrapolate that from to what we, we found, which is women don't run unless someone asks them to. And then they go f further than that and say, we don't, if we had more, if we asked more women, more women would run and then we'd have more women in office. But it's like, they came from nowhere. I mean, so we have to really think, why do women run? I mean, and build on those truths rather than on some uh, other made up thing. Anyhow, so I'm de debunking that right now. <laughs> now you could, oh, you, you could say, well, oh, it's only in, um, for women of color that that's true. But no, I, these people who were doing that research, it wasn't for women of color. So it's true that that's made up, okay? Fake news. Anyhow, <laughs> fake, 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 fake research, uh -oh. fake findings. Anyhow, <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that you will both talk about why you ran the first time, Bec and are they similar or different from what we found? Which is, I love this chapter because it's why they ran in their own words. We or we we analyze it by by data, but we also give give you a <coughs> sense. So there was this guy right from California. I wanted to build a di I wanted to build a di viaduct. He was very concrete. And I wanted to p get a pothole filled. And that made me start to think, how do you get potholes filled in the city? I, you know, what, do I, what should I do? And then she got involved with that. To be more general, then they, they got to more general things besides these concrete things. Like it began in the civil rights movement. They wanted people to run so they could get more people like us in office. And then the Latino municipal official who said, to serve my state, my community, and my people. There were desires expressed also to increase minority and or female representation. But in a lesser percentage, only 15% said strategic reasons, like there's an open seat that means they think they could win. Now, there was little evidence of what we call naked personal ambition, like I gotta be in office. And I, some of the people who've read my first book will remember when I said, why'd you run for office? One guy said, ego. Then he said, I better say something better than that, you know? But other people think I'm, I'm selfish, but, but some people still said ego, but, um, <laughs> but for the most part, there's very little this ambition, personal, I wanna get, I wanna be, a, I wanna be somebody, okay? But elected officials run for many reasons, especially a mix of focus on community and on issues, specific issues. In this chapter, we also challenge another firmly held assumption about women in politics. And I hate to say this, but there's a, that there's a political pipeline. 
that women can start in local office, slowly, gradually work their way up to a higher level office. And that, so we should get more women at the beginning of the pipeline and they'll funnel right up as if they're getting a funnel. It's like it's just going to go next. The, the weight will weigh them up or push them up. But that's not really true. Um, all, including women of color in our study, are, were self-starters for the most part. They didn't necessarily start in local office, even if they were members of Congress or if they were state legislators. They ju jump right in, just like the guys do. You think, what's, wh where should I run? What, why do I care? What do I want to do something? Now, uh, so, and, and the, but the bad news in the sense of the idea of pipeline, especially, is that most elected officials of color, at least, about three quarters stay in the same office they first run for. Now, the question there, which we do not answer, it's unclear whether it's because of a lack of progressive ambition, a lack of a career ladder, or is it that the pipeline to the higher office is a myth, which it could be, because people, again, like the, like the research, they, oh, research shows there's a pipeline, a farm team, forget it, you know. Um, or is it just that for people of color it's harder? Is it like Hillary's Cl Hillary Clinton's seemingly unbreakable glass ceiling, is there instead a, do people of color face a cement ceiling solidified by resistance based on race and gender together, which keeps them in a uh, uh, more lower level office. Now, I want to move on to one other topic often discussed in the literature, which is the disadvantages women face when running for office. Now, again, I'm eager to hear from Ayana and Michelle. What experiences did you bring to your first election campaign, and what about these double disadvantages that women of color are supposed to face in politics? Well, the results are very mixed. And we have a journalist uh, from uh, Emerson here, who I was explaining this to, who said, it turns out that men of color, especially black men and Latinos, it report the highest incidence of feeling marginalized and discriminated on the campaign trail because of their race. And that's true even including comments on personal opinions and raising money. Because a lot of the, a lot of the research that's been done has either been done only on women or only on white people, mostly white women. So when you ask a woman, did you, were, you, were you discriminated against because of, did you have a hard time because of money or, or your, your looks? or scrutiny of your family, and they say yes, well, that's great. Okay, they said yes, but compared to whom? So, that, but the men apparently feel it's even more, more higher percentage of men say, say that they were discriminated against or felt that there was scrutiny against their families or their looks or had a hard time, hard time raising money. And, um, and that's despite the fact that, as we show in Chapter 3, and contrary to the double disadvantage thesis, that black and Latino women are actually significantly less disadvantaged in education and occupation than their male counterparts, although more in terms of household income and marriage rate. So women of color are less likely to be married than their male counterparts in who hold office. And, um, and they are, but they are, have a higher level of education and occupational status. And that they all, but they do have few less income. Now remember we're talking about the winners, the ones who won, won. these are not the, uh, uh, candidates. And I am going to move right now because I, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip chapter <coughs> eight because that's too much. But I want to talk about, remember in the beginning I talked about the big takeaway was women of color that are the forces of change? Well, now I'm going to circle back to the second big takeaway from the book, which is the importance of local level officials in the prospects for democracy. And it's very relevant since the 2016 election because if you listen to pundits in the media all the time, every day I hear and read, they're shocked by the outcome of the presidential race, immediately they started talking about how Democrats, especially, have to go back to their communities and focus on developing new talent at the local level. George Packer in The New Yorker on November 21st wrote, quote, in the long run, the political Democratic Party faces two choices. It can continue to collapse until it transforms into something new, or it can rebuild itself from the ground up, not every four years, but continuously, not with celebrity endorsements, but on school committees and town councils. Eugene Robinson of the Washington Post also writes, quote, the Democratic Party cannot just wait for the next Barack Obama to come along. The president was a unique political talent of the kind that appears only once in a great while, when the ma stars magically align. Instead, Democrats need to do what Republicans did, which is to build from the ground up and start winning state and local elections. Attorney General Schneiderman of New York reminded us, quote, even if Hillary Clinton had won, Republicans still would be controlling 69 out of the 99 uh, legislative chambers in the state, like state legislatures, and 33 of the governor's man mansions. So you, you really have to think, okay, Massachusetts is different because you're very, very Democrat, but even so, if you think of other states, they're putting out policies and, and making decisions that people who maybe don't appreciate that need to make change on, and those are the people we need to really elect more um, people of color in. 
Now, and not, and not long ago, I heard former Florida Governor and Senator Bob Graham on, say on WGBH Radio, he said, forget the federal government, go local. So at first we wondered about why the elected officials of color that we surveyed, so many of them held local level offices. Not the survey, the whole database. Like 75% were, were all local officials. Now, did, did, were they only, did they have lower ambition? Were they go, settling for these lower level jobs? No. Turns out that 96% of all elected positions in this country are local levels. Do you realize that we talk about Congress? You know why we, there's so much on Congress, so much on the President, so much on Congress? It's easier to get them. It's, they're smaller in number. They say a lot, they do a lot. You know who they are, you know where they live. You can do studies on them all the time. State legislators, there's study, there's the National Council of the Conference of State Legislators. They give you the lists. You can study them where they are. It's very hard to study local officials. Things change. And at the center, we used to try to keep track of when the elections were going to be. Every city, every town has got a different election. School boards, we had a very hard time deciding who was a local official, who to count as a county commissioner even. So, but these le local elected officials oversee budgets of and spend a trillion dollars a year. Big influence. And they make policy decisions that affect our communities. They hire the police chiefs. And in many locales, they hire the su school superintendents. Now think Ferguson, Missouri. What it would have been like if you had a different city council composition there than you had at the time of, the, of Mar Mar um, Michael Brown murder. Now think this does not matter in, in heavily democratic Massachusetts. Think again. Think about the sanctuary cities. That's a local issue. That's something that makes a difference to people. And um, that's, a, that's definitely a local issue. And then everybody loves Charlie, Governor Baker. But his position as a Republican governor is less secure, as people realize he was more vulnerable given his lukewarm responses, Women's March, for example. Now, the Massachusetts also never had a woman governor. So thinking, besides Jay Gonzalez and all the usual suspects, Mara Healy, some people on the panel, perhaps, Maybe considering, because we've never had a woman governor in this, in this country. And it's time for that change. So, what, what, not sure what to do after all the marching. <laughs> Think about what the quote in the New York Times on January 24th was. The success of the post-Obama Democratic Party will be determined by whether the progressives who are roused right now will open their checkbooks and show up at their local Democratic committees in the lead up to the 2018 midterm elections. So, I know we're not supposed to be partisan, but the marching's got to do something, so let's go for it. Thank you. Hi. I'm one of the few people that have been here for the whole time, and I, every, when I used to see Carol all the time, instead of asking about her family and so forth, I asked her how the book's coming <laughs> along. And I know her uh, co-authors and so forth, so congratulations. Thank I'm going to tell you as a political scientist, this is a significant piece of work. It's the best book that I've ever read on the subject, and I read every single word of it. I wondered if I was going to be able to read 400 and some pages, but this is a true story. After the first half of the Super Bowl, I said, gee, I got to have something better to do than to watch this game. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled out the book, and then it started getting interesting. And so I had to put the book down for a while. And then just before the original date when we were supposed to have this session, we had a snow day on a Thursday. Thank God, because I was able to finish the book before <laughs> because of the snow day. So everything kicked in, and I did read this it's a outstanding book, really. I'm telling you, comprehensive. You can understand why it took so long methodologically. For those of you who are students, it uses a range of methodologies. Even I, I started writing all the concepts that they had developed in this thing, and I had pages upon pages of them. It's really an impressive piece of work, and I urge you to do it, and it will be an important contribution to the literature and to the practical lives of men and women of color and not of color who are considering issues about political representation. When I read the book, I was yanked at times. I was sort of elated, and then I'd get pulled down and get elated and get pulled down. For example, I came across a figure early on in the book that said there are about as many people who are elected officials of color that you could put in the Boston Garden, so occupy all the seats in the Boston Garden in the United States. And I thought, well, that I guess is a pretty impressive figure. But then I realized the figure later on and how many elected officials there are in the United States, and literally it equals the number of people that live in the city of Boston. So if you think about it, there are about a little more than 14,000 elected officials of color in the United States. There are over a half a million elected positions in, in, in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether you see that as significant or small, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, it's, it gave 
gave me a sense of perspective of there's a long way to go even though we've achieved a great deal. Now we couldn't bring all 15,000 of those elected officials inclu including the women of color here but we brought two of them here and they made the cover of the book of course <laughs> as well. And as Carol pointed out, we want to start off by giving them some time to answer the question that Carol posed to them, which is, why did you run and what has it meant being both a woman of color, uh, both a woman and a woman of color uh, in being an elected official? What was the motivation behind you running and what has it meant to you? So we'll start off with Councillor Presley. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so first, um, I just want to begin by uh, thanking uh, Dean Cash and Chang and thanking uh, Ann uh, and uh, Carol for your labor of love. Um, uh, Professor Watanabe said that it is comprehensive. It is comprehensive and it is also a compelling read. I have not read it in its entirety, um, but uh, Council President Wu and I uh, are often uh, traveling by way of public transit uh, some days at the mercy of it and um, and so uh, I'm sure we'll both be uh, you know pouring over it uh, in our daily commutes um, but I just want to say how appropriate it is that um, this is where we are convening uh, not only because of your obvious uh, connection and affiliation but you know we've been here so many times for um, events with the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy at the McCormick School um, the Trotter Institute you know and, and every conversation here is um, rich and uh, challenging. And so uh, this is very apropos and consistently in line with uh, the sorts of convenings that happen here um, at the university. And as someone who is very proud to call Dorchester uh, my home community, I often boast about this institution. Uh, so uh, why did I run? You know, I am, um, and we'll unpack some of this, I guess, a little, a little bit later, if, you know, time permitting. Uh, you know, Boston is an incredibly tribal, parochial uh, town, and this is an adopted home for me. Um, I came here to attend Boston University. Um, I'm originally um, from Chicago. Uh, I guess I'm a bit of a political cliche in that my mother uh, held many jobs, including as a community organizer. Uh, for the Urban League. Uh, she was a tenants' rights organizer. And um, so I would say that being raised by a single parent with um, one parent incarcerated um, on a very challenging uh, city block uh, in Chicago, um, while also my mother making great sacrifices financially to send me to one of the best schools in the city, you know, I really grew up with this sort of dual perspective and life experience. And um, there were many reasons why I did and should have felt um, invisible and voiceless, uh, given the challenging uh, conditions of our neighborhood, but also the, the issues destabilizing our household. But one thing was for sure, on voting day, I felt powerful. On election day, I felt powerful. That seed was planted for me uh, so early by my mother. I just remember being uh, at her waist and pulling that curtain. And so, you know, how I've encapsulized this is to say that my mother made sure that I knew my rights, um, that it was my right to live in a safer community, to have, receive a quality education, uh, quality health care, to have a job that paid well, uh, where I was treated with dignity. But she also made sure I knew what my responsibility was to that. So I was never cynical about the role of government. I always saw us as being, even very early in my life, in symbiotic partnership, that we were going to hold government accountable, we were going to do our part to civically engage, and that was not singularly just about checking a box. It wasn't only about voting. Uh, and so that seed was planted for me very early on. And um, you know, thereafter, uh, you know, pursued every uh, leadership opportunity that one could be appointed or elected to to build myself up but so that I could build my community up and I sort of had that very early I was in the third grade going to school in my church suit and fake pearls because that's what Barbara Jordan looked like that's what Shirley Chisholm looked like and even though I had never had the honor of meeting them I felt mentored by their example so fast forward um, I came here to attend Boston University and um, 
I was uh, president of my college. I was organizing a Martin Luther King Day celebration. And um, I said, I'm going to invite Congressman Frank and Congressman uh, Kennedy. And, um, and I said, I'm going to intern for one of them. I really believe in claiming things and sort of actualizing them in that way. And so that happened. So uh, I went on to intern for Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy II, who ultimately hired me. I worked for him for four years as a um, Social Security liaison working with our most vulnerable, which really confirmed for me the meaningful difference and impact that good government uh, what those interventions can have in people's lives. And then I was, um, if you ask Joe, he'll say I was poached. Um, I see <laughs> Mel Poindexter is here. He's known me a long time uh, from the state party. And so um, I went to work for, uh, at the time, Senator John Kerry, who was in a very contested um, reelection battle for the United States Senate against popular moderate Republican Governor Bill Wells. So Joe Kennedy, this is a very common practice in politics, sort of farmed me out. I went to work uh, for Senator Kerry. He was reelected, and then I went on to stay in that organization for 11 years, um, and uh, held many jobs for him. And the last position that I held for uh, Senator uh, Kerry was as his political director, and that really confirmed for me that at the core of all things politic is relationship. So it was my job to. Um, uh, solidify and preserve existing relationships, um, to build and cultivate new relationships, and the hardest part of my job, to repair broken relationships. <laughs> and so that was an incredible education. Um, in 2009, um, this sort of confirms maybe challenges some mm -hmm. of your research. I was, well, it challenges, uh, it debunks the myth um, that you're saying, but it confirms the myth, which is that I was recruited. <laughs> um, and you know, I was, um, and it's interesting because very early in my life, I think I'd had the aspiration of running, but having been an aide uh, to a congressman and a senator, um, I really was enjoying being the person behind the person and felt that just as influential. Uh, for everyone who's always looking for a meeting with the elected, please learn the value of aides because they are often, um, you know, the, the, the ear whisperer informing and shaping policy. Mm -hmm. And so I had sort of abandoned this political aspiration idea of running because I love being the person behind the person. Some people came to me and said, the data bears out that this is going to be the year. There's never been a woman of color elected to the Boston City Council, and this will be the year, and you are the woman. And I said, and you are crazy. Um, <laughs> It, nothing about my life was positioning me at that time to run for office. I, um, my mother, uh, may she rest in power, she has since transitioned after a valiant battle uh, against leukemia, but my mother was, had just come out of remission. I was her medical proxy, her caregiver and caretaker. Um, I had just purchased my first home. I was in a job working for a United States senator uh, that I found rewarding and loved. So nothing about my life said that I should be running for office. But ultimately, I said yes, and then I'll transition here, because I, it was the right opportunity, it was the right time, and it was really a furthering of a lifetime of public service. And it was an opportunity to actualize my values using my voice. <coughs> you know, I had spent one of the biggest barriers for me in running for office is that um, no one knew how I felt about anything, because I had been such a good aide and advancing the agenda and the perspective and the voice of someone else. And I was very fortunate because these were aides, uh, these were electeds whose values I shared. But I was intrigued by the challenge and the opportunity to now actualize those shared values using my voice. And um, I never ran to make history. I don't think people that make history set out to make it. <laughs> I, I actually don't even think that's a redeeming quality. Um, I didn't set out to make history, I was aware that if I was elected, I would be a first, but I hadn't really contextualized what that meant and what the impact would be. So, and now, <laughs> my sister in service and the president of the Boston City Council, a history maker, and I do want to just uh, say uh, to Dean uh, Chang, she is not just a hero in the Asian American community. Uh, she is a source of inspiration. Um, uh, for many, her trajectory has been inspiring and heroic, and so our president, we still get to say that. We get to call a woman a president on the Boston City Council, uh, Michelle Wu.
Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I am honored to be sitting uh, with this table of superstars and uh, renowned experts known across the country, um, each and every one of you uh, for your contributions to making sure that everyone's voice is heard. And particularly, I mean, you see what we have to work with on the Boston City Council. I am so thrilled and honored to be part of a group of 13 people who care deeply about our city residents, but making sure that this is all grounded in the reality of real people's lives, uh, which I think often can get lost in these theoretical conversations about policy. Uh, I have now had the pleasure of serving with Councilor Presley for going on our fourth year now, right? Yes. We're in the second year of, our sec of yes. my second term. Um, and have only, I mean, she was a rock star and sort of a, this mythical mentor hero before I, I really knew her and as I was, you know, starting to get involved and follow Boston politics, but um, serving alongside her, seeing how she approaches every conversation, every policy question, uh, I, it has only really, really deepened how much I look up to you, uh, how much I, I really appreciate the depth of her commitment to community and, um, and, and principles. So it, you know, I feel very lucky as we're watching all the craziness in DC that uh, in Boston, when it comes to, to talent, when it comes to um, people who really care, we, we have that in, in high supply here. Um, so I appreciate the, the chance to comment on the book uh, I'm glad Ayana mentioned it. Most of m what I read of it, it did happen on the T <laughs> <laughs> in, in various, uh, uh, at various stops. And um, I felt a little bit like I was back in school. There was this deadline. <laughs> it was moved back <laughs> one time. Um, and, and uh, you know, sort of thumbing through. There were some parts where I just read the conclusion, uh, but, but the other okay. parts I did go through um, in depth for various chapters. And I would say overall, um, what I love about this book, and you know, I don't have the academic um, perspective and knowledge of the field to recognize what a um, what a landmark this is for for um, sort of the academic world. But from someone who's a practitioner, someone who lives and breathes this, uh, it was it was a little strange to be sort of seeing myself in the <laughs> data, and it was so liberating to read it as well. Uh, because this book, it, it resists a singular, simplifying, suffocatingly normative narrative of what it means to be an elected official, a woman of color in politics. And, um, you know, we are, our experiences are often reduced to a particular stereotype or a particular set of anecdotes. Uh, so to hear what other elected officials were saying about why they ran, to see the numbers across uh, multiple ethnic backgrounds and not just sort of mm -hmm. everyone lumped together or one dimension of race mm -hmm. or gender right. um, was was really really meaningful um, I want to I will get into questions about specifics uh, on, on the book I'm sure um, I wanted to point out especially that I appreciated the recognition of how the individual and the community and its historical perspective are all interacting together as people are making decisions as one person within that context of whether to run, how to operate once you are in office, et cetera. Um, recognizing that it's not just about personal ambition, but also personal and family resources. Uh, and, and seeing those charts and, and the Asian American officials in particular often coming with you know, education, often coming with um, access to uh, resources, but lacking the family background and lacking the, the family resources and exposure to politics was something that resonated a great deal with me, as I'll get into. Um, and most of all, it was, it was really nice to see the narratives of why people, and particularly women, women of color, run for office, to see those narratives challenged. Uh, and, and I'll start transition into my own um, story with this uh, debunking that you did, which I so appreciated, that women just simply have to be asked and, and, and that, that's it and we're never asked um, or, or we need to be asked multiple times and you know, sufficiently enough. Um, 
I, you know, I had heard that over and over and over again. And reflecting on my own experiences, I had never been asked to run for office growing up. And then that sort of made me feel bad. You know, why wasn't I asked as a woman? <laughs> Should I not be running? Should other women be running instead? And so I think once you, once you reduce everything to those one-liners that are, in fact, not grounded in data, um, it, it also has a further um, normative effect on people's behavior as well. That's true. So I was thinking about this concept of being asked to run for office and, um, and believe that you know, two things have to happen for you to be asked to run, particularly early on in your life as you're thinking about what to do with yourself. And the first is that you need to be in rooms where politics is being discussed as a preliminary <laughs> base point. And second, you need to be seen by other people who are in those rooms as someone who could be a credible leader. And in my experience, neither of those applied as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I was never in rooms where we were talking about current <coughs> events, politics, government. My parents immigrated to the United States uh, before I was born, so I was born in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm the oldest of four kids. We didn't speak English at home for the first 10 years of my life as my parents were, were uh, learning the language. We only ate dinner with chopsticks at home up through, I think the first time I sat down for a formal dinner, um, and in fact the very first picture of me in the Boston Globe was actually from college when I went to um, a seminar that was being offered by our Office of Career Services. They did an etiquette seminar uh -huh. and teaching people um, how to you know, navigate multiple forks and knives and this and that, how do you break the bread, how do you pass, who, which drink, which side <laughs> drinks and this. It was all foreign to me. I, I had literally never been to a dinner where you needed to, to use multiple sets of utensils uh, li li in, until that point in college because, it, it, you know, we had Chinese food, we went to the Chinese grocery store every weekend, um, and, and that was um, my lifestyle growing up as, as the daughter of immigrants. I think also because of my family's um, back immigration background, my parents having come from Taiwan to the United States, their parents having gone from mainland China in the midst of the communist revolution to the island of Taiwan, politics was always synonymous with bad things happening to people. And my parents wanted nothing more than for me to have a stable job that paid a lot that I wouldn't get in trouble for. <laughs> and you know, what we're doing is the opposite of, of <laughs> all of those <laughs> dimensions, really. John Lewis <laughs> <Good> trouble. <laughs> so, um, and, and talking about um, the power of role models, right? You, you, you mentioned um, the figures that loomed large in your life. Um, there was really one in mine, and, and one person that people kept asking me, will you become like her one day? The one Asian American woman who was sort of popularly known when I was growing up and that was Michelle Kwan. Mm. And so I was asked nonstop if I would be a figure skater, an <laughs> Olympic figure skater <laughs> one day. Um, and you know, think about the odds of doing that versus <laughs> running public service. No one touched that uh, in, in asking me to, to consider that. So it wasn't until I graduated college, some things were happening in my family. My mom began to struggle with mental illness. I found myself caretaker of two younger sisters, a mother, owner of a family business that I started to see firsthand why government mattered, how politics interacted with it, and then deciding to go to law school to learn more about it, uh, to you know, build up my credentials and, and expertise in, in how to fix things for people who were dealing with similar problems, and sort of by chance being exposed first to Mayor Menino in City Hall through an internship, and then to um, then Professor Warren uh, launching her U.S. Senate campaign in my third year of law school. Had I not had those experiences, had I not seen firsthand not just the importance of doing government and doing politics, but also how to do it, what tools were involved, there is no way I would be sitting in this seat. Uh, and there were many, many others who you know, provided trainings along the way and encouragement and this and that, uh, but going from a background of absolutely no exposure to politics to being in the thick of it um, has resulted in some unique experiences. And I guess the last point I wanna make is on the pipeline piece, that um, I appreciate cha the challenging the notion that 
you put someone in and then magically, you know, it'll get to be their turn and, and that's all we have to do is sit back. It is much more, you know, from what I've, in my short time in politics, uh, pipeline and this idea of moving on to different positions or growing in, in your political stature has to be about much more than personal ambition, particularly for elected officials of color, particularly for women of color, because your success and your um, ability to be seen as a credible leader depends not just on your own desire to be that leader, but your ability to, to demonstrate legislative success policy-wise and your ability to demonstrate uh, political growth, both of which require navigating these traditional institutions that often are not designed uh, for newcomers or folks who look different from the mold to succeed in. So as we're thinking about that narrative of pipeline and how you both get in the funnel in the first place but then, but then um, move towards success within this world, I think we also have to really keep in mind that elected officials of color, women of color, have to not only navigate within these institutions, but have to be, be comfortable reshaping them. Mm -hmm. Because our approach, our perspectives are often so different from our backgrounds to begin with that we're starting, we're introducing either new, new content or, or um, at least helping prioritize issues differently. And that in, you know, in turn, leads to a different model of how you govern, mm -hmm. how you um, work with other people, what types of policies and for whom you're talking, uh, you're introducing policy. So um, I've already been more of a politician than I wanted and droned <laughs> on and on. Uh, <laughs> but um, appreciate you all being here and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. First of all, isn't it refreshing to have elected officials that read books? I want to thank everybody, uh, and we want to open up for questions. I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first while you're coming up with yours, but I want to go back to a point that Ann made at the beginning and the title of the book, Contested Transformation. I think it's a great title. I must say I've stolen it a million times for other contexts because uh, it's a great title. But part of that contestation, I think, is, as pointed out by Ann, we had the first woman running for the highest <laughs> office in the land. We just had the transformation of the first African-American elected to the highest office in the land. And the question is, is whether the Trump victory is part of that contested transformation, if it's partially resolved. And I don't want you to talk so much about Trump. I want you to talk about the general public's response, that is, there was a clear color divide in terms of the vote itself. There was a clear gender divide to some degree, including amongst white women, for example, who supported uh, President Trump, and while the vast majority of women of color supported Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if anybody and anybody on the panel, if they wish to comment on that element of whether the state we're in, and who knows what it is, I haven't checked my Twitter feed for the last five <laughs> minutes or so, uh, the state we're in right now is part of that contested transformation, a response to the Clinton campaign or the Clinton ascendant in the Obama victory. Well, I'd like to say one thing. It was about the, oh, sorry, about sorry. Uh, about the voting in, uh, in November because, first of all, the, the ch last chapter of the book, which I did not talk about at all, is about potential for coalitions, potential for coalitions in uh, and whether – the coalitions would be between <coughs> black women, black men, and Asians, and by race and gender, or whether also women of color could be make coalitions by about with women, white women. And then when at least 53 percent of white women voted for Trump, I was like, whoa, that's not going to happen then. Um, but then I also noticed that in the, I think it was in the black community that it was like 97 percent of wi wi black women voted for, voted for Hillary. It was like 73 percent or something for, of black men did. There's some big gender gaps there that were very large, and um, didn't, didn't yes. And so I'm just curious whether we need to think about how do how do you, how do you build coalitions when there's this divide that's um, by by gender and race because it's I'm I'm just having a real trouble with that part. So others, you want to respond? Anybody? Um, so I. 
So, uh, you know, I guess what I'm uh, experiencing on the front lines of this right now, um, <clears throat> the one uh, silver lining is that perhaps we are finally breaking down our silos within our respective movements mm. and that there's an opportunity, um, an impetus, a compelling for people to be more intentional and inclusive in their movement building, um, which it has taken this long mm. because there has not been this understanding of the intersectionality of all these issues and that our uh, destinies and our liberties are inextricably linked uh, and tied to one another. Uh, the other thing that I would just argue is that I do believe that despite the uh, many historic elements of Barack Obama's presidency, that it did inject with steroids a level of racism and bigotry uh, that has been unfurled. Um, the upside to that is that I can now sit in a room like this amongst academics or any room in the city of Boston, and we can talk about white supremacy mm -hmm. and racism and systemic racism and oppression, and people not marginalize that as some uber fringe lefty sentiment. A year ago, I'm not so sure that would have been the case. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of a greater inclusive inclusion in our movement building, uh, in terms of a uh, epiphany that people have had about the fact that our destinies are tied, and an acknowledgement of systemic racism, white supremacy, and oppression, I think have been uh, the silver linings. Um, and so, you know, I'm encouraged by that. And I will share one story actually that I, I told Ann when we were Having, having coffee together uh, recently. Um, she's brilliant. This is someone's uh, mm -hmm. counsel I seek uh, often about many issues, and she's uh, closely uh, following and a partner in, in our collective work around early education and care. Um, but I was saying that I was at an event recently, and uh, there were 100 plus people in the room, and another part of the, your research, Carol, that I think is, is, is important to sort of speak to is, you know, it depends on where women of color are running, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I'm, when I'm with my colleagues in government in Chicago and Atlanta, you know, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, uh, Michelle and I are less of a unicorn, you know? I mean, we're a greater anomaly here, given the storied mm -hmm. uh, racial history and how segregated Boston is. Very diverse city, mm -hmm. we tout that it's 53% people of color, but still <laughs> incredibly segregated. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. having been born in Ohio, raised in Chicago, lived and worked in Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is about, this is why we're fighting so hard for, you know, affordable housing and mixed <laughs> uh, income and transit access and, you know, by design, you know, through urban planning, how can we foster a greater integrated approach and in how we build community, how we build movements, how we advance things, very segregated city. So it isn't shocking that I could be in a room in downtown Boston with 100 plus influencers and it'd be all white and two brown people, myself who was a speaker and one other guest. At the end of the event, um, a woman approached me and said, I've been for 30 years going to rooms like this in the city of Boston, and I want to know why you didn't bring 50 black women with you to this event, and what are you doing to change that? Now, maybe your immediate response would be, well, how progressive and benevolent and thoughtful of her. Um, actually, uh, I found the comment very offensive, and it was a double down on what has frustrated so many of us. So you, and I said to her, in this moment, you have affirmed that it is only my right, only my responsibility to ensure inclusion. In that moment, you affirmed that the Black Lives Matter movement is only for black people to affirm that black lives matter. And this is in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, progressive Boston. There are a lot of blind spots people who believe they are so evolved and so progressive 
and that she would come in a public setting and challenge me about what I'm doing around inclusion. So we had a very frank conversation. And again, I said, I hope coming out of this, if I saw you on the commons at the reproductive justice rally, I will now see you at the state house advocating and lobbying for criminal justice reform. And that is really the challenge for all of us. And I am encouraged that some incremental steps are being made uh, in that regard. Did you want to say anything, Michelle, or you don't have to? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I want to say a little bit about um, the, the sort of the depth of racism and the depth of sexism that I think both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama have surfaced. Um, I mean, I don't think it's a mistake that we saw this unbelievable rise in attacks against black male citizens of the United States with our first African American president. Um, I mean, I don't know consciously that those white police officers were thinking of Barack Obama when they did what they did, but I think they were unconsciously doing that. And I think that we are seeing a huge backlash against the election of Barack Obama in the Trump election. Um, I think we really need to be thinking about a 21st century version of the civil rights movement. I feel the accomplishments of the civil rights movement were so profound and, but as we know, with the passage of any piece of progressive legislation, it's all in the implementation. It's all in the continued fight. And I think that among white people, there's been a kind of complacency that is unjustified and kind of unconscionable. And I really hope that one of the things that can come out of this surfacing of white supremacy and the alt-right is a kind of new level of consciousness among white people about white skin privilege and what it really means. White skin privilege is a concept that I came across as a young radical in the early 1970s and I used to talk about it and people used to look at me like, what are you talking about? And now I think we have a lot of evidence of white skin privilege and we need to look it right in the eye as white people and say, what does this mean? Um, I just wanna also say a little bit about Hillary Clinton. Um, there has been a campaign of hatred against Hillary Clinton since she arrived on the scene in Arkansas and particularly when she arrived on the scene in Washington and I was there in the first term of the Clinton administration, as you heard. Um, I heard people say things about Hillary Clinton that were just kind of knocked my socks off. Like somebody said to me, are you going to the White House Christmas party? And I said, well, actually I'm not a high enough level political appointee to be on that list, but you know, I'm sure it'll be great. And they said, well, let me just tell you, if you went to that White House Christmas party, Hillary Clinton has hung condoms on the Christmas tree. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I was hearing about Hillary Clinton from the day that I set foot in Washington. And again, I feel like the level of anti-woman language that was used to describe Hillary Clinton for many, many, you know, for decades um, is unacceptable. It's just absolutely unacceptable and it hasn't been challenged, I don't think, enough by women and by men. And um, I think we need to look at that campaign of hatred against Hillary. I don't think she was a perfect candidate. She wasn't necessarily my first choice, um, but I don't think we can stand by and allow people in the, our public discourse 
to talk about women the way people talk about Hillary Clinton. Um, so anyway, I just want to end by saying that I absolutely love that you wore the pink hat. <laughs> I wished I'd brought a pink hat. I don't actually have one yet. Um, I, I think that there is, in the Women's March, a great sense of hope and I don't know if it's going to be mobilized and crystallized the way it needs to be but I think there was a kind of diversity and a kind of anti-siloing of issues and and a kind of coming together of men and women and lesbian gay transgender queer people of color people Muslims Jews um, Christians that I've never seen before, and I've been politically active since the early 70s. I've never seen that much coming together. And so I'm reading a book that I recommend to all of you right now. It's by Rebecca Solnit. It's called Hope in the Dark. And I feel like that's where we are in this period. We have to search for hope in the dark. And I'm searching, and I'm so grateful to Michelle and Ayana and Carol and Paul for, I, I feel that we're, even though we've never said it to each other, I feel like we're all searching in the dark together. And I hope everybody in this room is part of that search. Wow, great. To chime in to the um, beautiful, uh, historic and political and, and socio-cultural context is that um, I agree with all that's been said about the current state of affairs uh, as being directly related to the sort of illusory um, and real advances that the U.S. has seen in terms of political representation. Um, but I'm, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work to get out from where we are. I'm not assured that it's sort of a one step forward, two steps back, and then another guaranteed two steps forward type of situation. I think the all of the above has been related to people all across the country feeling increasingly disconnected from each other as communities and demographics in this country are accelerating towards a majority minority country as we already have in the city of Boston uh, where neighborhoods and, and blocks are you know look people look different from you the different cultural um, customs and um, you know the the youth of the country are already almost there in terms of being uh, a majority of, of people of color and no single um, group being in, in the majority. And you know that that changes your assumptions about uh, who it, you know grew up like you or or um, you're maybe your proxy for closeness to your neighbors. It takes a lot more work. <laughs> To get to know your neighbors and to build that community, uh, w as you have, to, as you learn about other customs and cultures and um, people who've had different experiences from you, and the other piece of it is that people are feeling increasingly disconnected from policies and from government as an institution, because uh, you know, rightly so, because many have been left behind with. Um, <coughs> economic mobility now at almost an all-time low in our country with this millennial generation being the first generation in a very, very long time where our life prospects in terms of life expectancy and, and, um, and economic prospects are lower than our parents' generation. Uh, and, and that is a direct result of policies and laws that have put in, been put in place from redistricting and gerrymandering and campaign finance all the way to um, you know limits on corporations and the financial markets and uh, who gets access to this pie that that the United States has. So I would say my my silver lining that I'll contribute to to the doom and gloom is that mm -hmm. I believe the the solution to the disconnectedness can happen and is happening at the local level. Mm -hmm. That connecting people to each other, that connecting people back to government can happen in these face-to-face, block-by-block, um, municipal policy conversations. And it's up to, I mean, it's, it's t it takes a lot of work and we have a long way to go, but in Boston, we, we can really be the example of breaking down the silos, of bringing people together, of establishing the coalitions, uh, and connecting people back to this idea that government is a force for good for the larger community, 
uh, but that that requires everyone to participate uh, and and slowly to realize that voting in your municipal elections uh, aka 2017 <laughs> matters just as much if not more than you know for the White House every every four years what's that sorry yeah sure um, yes participation and I just you know um, our our former, as painful it is to say this, our former First Lady, Michelle Obama, uh, you know, once said that um, the challenge for us is that there are, there are those who see our diversity as a threat to be contained instead of talent to tap into. And, you know, that is the challenge for us when we're talking about representation, gender and racial uh, uh, parity uh, in government, when we're talking about wealth um, the wealth gap and income inequality. We're talking about um, a city with a history like Boston. You know, I keep saying what we've got to do is ensure that DNI diversity and inclusion is not just some, you know, kumbaya moment of collective song mm -hmm. or some, um, you know, fun bumper sticker or hashtag. Diversity and inclusion uh, at every level is ultimately about are you willing to share power mm -hmm. and that is that is really what this is a what this is about and so when we are choking at the full participation of a society we are also choking at undermining and compromising compromising mm -hmm. our full innovation and where we can go I really appreciate all that almost everyone has said a lot of this is about, the conversation is about um, getting people of color and women to vote for us. Um, but the comment for me to speak to a deeper issue that needs to be addressed, which is, is it? It's as if, if we could just get more people to run and be there, that would be a success. But I think, Michelle, you, you said it quite directly. You said it's not only about getting in there, but it's about Shaping. That's, that's right. And I want to talk about that piece because that piece tends to be less visible. And sometimes it's a popular culture where they exaggerate things and we get a deeper, more intense picture. But there's something about politics itself that produces the policies that have left people feeling so disengaged. It feels like we need to have a strategy not just for running people in our office and supporting them to individuals, but we need to have a strategy for almost like getting um, a critical mass of people in there who hold the kinds of values that you guys do, because it's hard to chip away at that culture that's not designed for you to be there when you're just getting people in, especially at the, at the rate that Carol's book documents. And so I feel like we, you named it, and actually Barbara named it couple of years ago, she said, we need an emancipation agenda for the 21st century. And in that, that's about changing the, the, the culture of politics, and it's also about changing the culture of civic participation, so that all those things that are so invisible and not clear, all those barriers that are currently here for so many people, are removed. Because I think it's a culture of politics that we need to really change. Great. Thank you. Let's take a couple more questions and then, please. Um, I actually was listening to what you said, Michelle, uh, about the credible leader part. I'm just curious to know um, a little bit more about how maybe I've been listening a lot of, to a lot about respectability politics. Um, and I'm wondering how that intersects with how you were elected or how you experienced that. Okay. And we're going to a clarification before. Yeah, sorry. Uh, respectability politics are usually, um, so I was listening to a podcast by NPR the other day that's talking about how Michael Brown's not a really great, like, example of it because he's not a perfect person. A lot of times, like, with um, the deaths of people, it's usually, like, the idealized ones, the ones that don't have any trouble past are the ones that are seen as... Sir. Um... I kind of touched on something this evening. I'm kind of curious as to, this is to all the panelists. Uh, out of the 2016 election, the concept of identity politics came into play. And 
as that fear came in, you started seeing that as a repercussion in 53% of white people voting for Donald Trump. To combat that and try to increase community participation and actual voter participation so we can have more women of color represented here, what strategies do we put in place to try to combat that fear of a majority minority city like Boston and white voters not being afraid to put their faith, their votes, into electing more women of color, like both Council President and Council President. And I'm going to take one more and then uh, we're going to have a response, sir. Uh, I just, and this is more general for the whole panel, how do you solve the also urban-rural divide where I don't want to say it's easier in, a, in an urban community where you're interacting with more women or you're interacting with more uh, people of color, but the further, and I grew up in a rural community, but the further, especially Massachusetts, you start getting beyond certain communities and it's, it's harder to sort of bridge that gap. And I think you also saw that in, in, in this election where if you look at a Wisconsin, Madison, and Milwaukee went very much for Hillary Clinton, you take one step into more rural counties and it's gonna, it, it flips on itself. Okay, so let people we'll one respond, and you can pick your which one you want to respond to. Well, I'm going to respond Carol. a little bit to the last two, but also the respectability one. I can't remember exactly the other one, but first I want to talk about the identity politics thing because one of the things that concerns me greatly after this last election was that do you remember back in 2012 when they did an autopsy? The Republicans did an autopsy of the Romney race. Said we have to be more inclusive. We don't need to really reach out to Latinos and blacks and and be more diverse. Of course, then Trump gets in with doing the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm concerned that the Democratic Party, even though we're, the center is nonpartisan, I understand that, and the McCormick has to be also, we have to think that for the benefit of the communities that, have been dis dis that are being deserved now, um, you have to be careful with an autopsy of the Democratic Party that I heard on uh, radio today that were saying that we need to really think, there's a lot of conversation about we have to get back those disaffected white voters to change so we can bring them back to the fold. Why did we lose them? Why did we lose them? Hillary didn't really appeal to those people. And I'm very concerned the Democratic Party is going to go that step. They're going to do what they said they were going to do in an autopsy as opposed to the Republicans did the opposite. We need to really think through that. When I, in the last chapter, we talk about the, um, the ways coalitions can happen, not only between blacks and Latinos and Asians who not necessarily, they don't necessarily occupy all the same spaces in most of the country. Boston, they don't occupy the same space as whites, but there, there's a little more con connection, I think. But in some parts of the country, is our age, the Asians are in California and Hawaii, mostly, in, this, in terms of where the representatives are. In the Southwest, has always been the Latinos, Mexican-Americans. But that's not 100% true, but there's a lot of sense that there's this disconnect between people. We really have to bring these groups together, otherwise you're going to have a majority minority of a lot of dis di different groups. We need to really think what the coalition is going to be because there's some major, major problems with the fact that one of the reasons we, when we wrote the book, I was a little worried we were so late getting it done because some of the issues that I talk about in chapter, chapter uh, 8, which are positions that the elected officials share, was, uh, which, and they have a lot of commonalities on voting rights, on immigration policy, on education policy, on women's reproductive rights, and on same-sex marriage. We had, we had these these questions, and then we, turns out that we thought, oh, this book's going to be so late, but it's gonna be, they're going to be all useless points in this, in this book because voting rights was solved. 2007, it was reauthorized with bipartisan support. Immigration reform was on its way with W doing great immigration rep reform. But reproductive rights, oh, that's, it's still a battle, but it's not as bad, maybe. Um, but we, we really realize now that these, other than same-sex marriage, which probably will stay, that everything else is being contested again. So we really have to be thinking, how do we take the greater numbers of people of color in most places in the country and women's potential, now especially after the march, maybe white women will see, well, wait, the ones that voted wrong will say, hey, we, we regret, we, get the, we need to get the regretters back, but not by changing and disavowing the identity politics. We need to get back to realizing that people of color are the important and, and better better candidates, really, in terms of getting elected. So we really need to be thinking more about, we don't want to do an autopsy and say, let's get back to these disaffected whites. We're never going to do it at all. 
people who vote, and we have to also talk a little bit about this third party issue. You know, that there were third party candidates this time, you know, and that did not help either. So, anyway, that's my, my <coughs> anybody want to respond to anything they've heard? Well, you asked a specific question, Michelle, about yeah. respectability politics. And I think actually several, if not all, of the questions touching on reshaping the political culture, you know, diversifying models of leadership and, and how, how accessible is that really, identity politics, um, solving the urban-rural divide, I get at this root of we are a very divided um, society and country right now, and how do we get to, how do we um, use the political system to try to bring people together in some way and bridge these divides? Um, so. I, w I was thinking of two shorthand solutions for that. Um, the first is authentic leadership, and the second is accessible influence. So I think you know, getting at credible leader and, and respectability politics, you know, the reason why I never saw myself as being able to run for office one day or even you know, be a leader in any way when I was younger is because I had this idea in my mind that you had to be a certain type of person to be a leader tall, loud, mm -hmm. a man, angry, uh, you know, able to captivate large, cl large crowds, and- Have um, yellow hair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Orange. Orange hair. <laughs> or, or orange, right? Um, and it, it, it's been a long process of, one, discovering that um, I have my own separate leadership style that may be distinct from others that I have seen modeled, and two, that that style, when I apply it in my own way and am comfortable with it, can be just as effective, if not more effective, um, in reshaping some of these institutions. So most of all, I think what people crave these days in this age of being able to know everything about anyone and anything um, is authenticity. And you know, I, there were many things in my background that I wasn't sure that I wanted to share or that would go well if I shared. You know particularly around my mother's illness and, and different family experiences we've had, you know, having, you know, being in those emergency rooms with her and, and responding to crises where she ha was causing disruptions or, you know, people called the police because of this or that and, um, and just realizing that there's a whole set of um, issues out there that we don't talk about mm -hmm. and that are really affecting people's lives and until we start talking about them, we're not going to have any chance of putting in place policies to actually address them. So I want to, you know, it's not enough just to ask, but I am asking you all to run, uh, but run as yourself mm -hmm. and not as, you know, not thinking that you have to prepare yourself to fit into this box or this set of experiences to one day be credible. Mm -hmm. uh, because the more, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the more distinct and diverse models of leadership we have, that's how we bring communities together. When every community feels that they can participate and they have access to power, they have access to changing the policies, we actually will be more on the same page than I think people realize. When it comes to the urban and rural divide, the countries, you know, from my point of view, countries and cities' long-term interests are in connecting back to local um, food cycles and our security is in being able to have uh, locally generated power and um, jo you know, worker co-op jobs and, and bringing the influence and bringing the economic power back down to the level of individuals, which, you know, don't get me wrong, there are, a, there are a lot of storied institutions who spend a whole lot of money trying to make sure that um, that doesn't happen because there are lots of profits at stake. But if you get down to it, uh, much, of, much of sort of the, the um, real people's lives actually are revolving around the same set of issues and the same set of concerns that uh, that we should be putting policies in place to address. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I totally agree with all of that. Uh, very well articulated. And, um, you know, my response to this has been that we need to actively listen, which would, you know, get at a lot of what Michelle was just saying uh, in terms of people realizing that uh, there are commonalities and so many of these issues are transcendent but we need to actively listen we need to inclusively strategize and um, you know I do think that women bring a uh, we more we uniquely and effectively govern in that I do think we bring the full confluence to bear 
of our life and professional experiences and that lens to whatever we do. Um, never forgetting that when we're looking at a budget, that behind every number is a person and a story mm -hmm. and elevating and amplifying that. And so even when it is uncomfortable, um, I think it was Pearl Cleage that said, um, uh, discomfort uh, is required for enlightenment that we have a willingness to make ourselves personally uncomfortable and perhaps even others uncomfortable um, because we know that our story is our story but we don't have the monopoly on it. And I would say one of the challenges in being a woman of color is, is, is um, being stereotyped mm -hmm. and, and being pigeonholed. And so when I ran the first time, the media would, would, would question, is, um, is Boston ready? Um, will traditional voters vote for Ayanna Presley, which was just you know, really cold language for will white people vote for her? Right. Right. And so I made it a point that I was not going to stereotype people, the electorate, or neighborhoods. Um, many people encouraged me to run, and I didn't make a, this up, but as a man, which most people define in this world, to run on your resume. So they wanted me to speak more about working in Congress, working for a senator, and not to tell the totality of my personal story. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I fired that consultant <laughs> and I said, you know, you don't get to decide, you know, how I tell my story. I'm going to tell the whole story. And they told me all these things you're going to make white voters uncomfortable and black folks ashamed. You are perpetuating a stereotype and a narrative about the black experience. Talking about your father battling addiction, being incarcerated, raised by a single parent. But I knew that that was my story, but not only mine. And so, I mean, I'll tell a funny story. I was at the uh, Broadway T station uh, meeting of uh, voters in my first run, and a ruddy face complexion, you know, stoutly built uh, white man in uh, maybe a public works vest or something was running towards me at the Broadway station saying, are you Ayanna Presley? I didn't know if I wanted to acknowledge <laughs> that it was actually <laughs> me. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I'm glad you're running. It's about time there was a black woman on that council. So, you know, again, and people would say, your father battled addiction. It was my brother. You're a survivor of sexual violence. It was my sister. I mean, so these are really transcendent things. But it's been a struggle for me um, for people to not see the benefit, the added value of my voice of just being about women and people of color. You know, government suffers with a lack of cognitive diversity. That's what we're talking about. This is about a diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought. And then finally, to Michelle's point about, you know, um, and I want to talk about Hillary very quickly and just say that politics is the only work that you can do where the more you do it, the less credible you are. <laughs> One of my other regrets in running for office the first time was that we did a poll. Now, how do you do a poll in a race where you can vote for up to four people? So we paid all this money for this poll. I will not tell you how much it costs because it's embarrassing. And only for the people to come back and they said, no one knows who you are. Well, duh. So outside of political circles, very few people knew me. But what the poll did reveal is that people didn't like when I talked about my experiences in government that people, and I think this happened with Hillary and others, mm. that the more you do this, suddenly the less credible you are. <laughs> Maybe people feel that you, in any other vocation, you are more of an expert. You are more of a professional. But in politics, people become even that much more cynical. So that was something you know, that I had to overcome. Mm -hmm. So Let's yeah. give Anne the final word appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so. I want to just talk a little bit about walls and othering. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the things that is going on with uh, the election of, I, I, it's hard for me to say the word president first, but anyway, um, <laughs> Mr. Trump, is this um, institutionalization of othering. And I think it's extremely dangerous um, to not be able to see, you know, your story in the face and the stories of other people. Um, I think that, you know, when we look back at the rise of Nazism, um, we see this kind of othering in the face of, you know, brutal economic insecurity, mm -hmm. 
trauma from a previous war. Um, I don't. I don't underestimate the kind of trauma that this country went through with the Iraq war. And I think if you look at what's going on with the returning Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, you see something that is very hard to look at. But I, I think that we really need to not build walls, build bridges. I mean, that is a little bit of a cliche at this point. On the other hand, I can't in some ways think of anything more profound to say because I think the construction of a bridge is involves physical labor. It involves um, putting things together that you're not quite sure how they fit. It means um, using materials that are concrete and creating spaces. It, it involves an aesthetic kind of design of a, like what makes a bridge beautiful. Uh, there are so many things that go into building bridges that I think um, counter othering and can be a basis for unity. So I just call on each of us to try to imagine, try to envision the bridge that you want to build. And I, right. I'd like to add to that because one of the things that we did look for in this project with the women that we, and the men that we studied for this project that resulted in the book was that women have a bridge building capacity. That women of color, especially with bridging the race and gender and their political lives in a complex world, that you do have this, you do bring this bridging uh, capacity, a bridging divide between people. So I see, as I said at the very beginning, I see you as both the premise of the book and the f hope for the future. So I hope that you will continue the good work. Thank you. Someone to decide to uh, emigrate across the Sahara Desert and then across the Mediterranean t and leave their family and everything behind. I mean, you got to be powerfully motivated to do that. And it doesn't take a whole lot to make someone just decide, instead, I'm going to stay here.